start, uh, I apologize. We had uh, some uh, technical problems, uh, and um, but now we are ready uh, to start. So welcome all to this uh, day of tutorials or the uh, workshops or workshop on uh, stochastic uh, thermodynamics. And then uh, we start uh, with uh, Massimiliano Esposito, who will give a, a review on inclusive uh, stochastic thermodynamics. So uh, Massimiliano, the uh, floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for all these problems. Can you hear me well? Can you just confirm that you hear me well? Yes, yes, we can hear you well. Okay, and, and do you see my full screen or do you see also the videos on top of my presentation? I see the full screen uh, and uh, on the side I see the... Okay, then let me put yeah. it in the corner like this and hope that it's going to work like this. No, no, I don't see, I don't see your screen, uh, your uh, video on the screen, on the slides. Ah, okay. So you see my slides well. I can start. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> um, so I was asked to give a tutorial on uh, inclusive stochastic thermodynamics, uh, which means, uh, as I found out, that um, Inclusive refers to the fact that uh, it's encompassing both the system and the bath. And so my way of understanding that is what are the, the microscopic foundations of stochastic thermodynamics when we look also at what happens into the bath. And so my plan uh, will be to uh, try to show how we can recover these laws that originally were from phenomenological thermodynamics. And I think it's fair to say now that within stochastic thermodynamics in the sense of the theory that one can build on top of a stochastic dynamics, which can be seen as a kind of effective theory for the system itself, where the, the bath is not explicitly present. Uh, so the, the current theory of stochastic thermodynamics basically has achieved um, uh, the goal of uh, mimicking, reproducing all the requirements from phenomenological thermodynamics, mean, namely splitting uh, the energy of the system into two contributions, one that is called heat and another one work, and the rationale behind that splitting is the second law, which identifies in the change for the system entropy the, an irreversible part, that is this sigma called the entropy production, and the reversible part that is uh, beta times the heat. So in other words, the, the heat is that part of the energy that ends up contributing to the entropy balance and which can be thought of as the one contributing to the entropy change into the reservoir. And the difference between the entropy change in the system and the one in the reservoir is this entropy production. And what characterizes, um, uh, yeah, what, what Another key important uh, a key property is the fact that entropy, the rate of entropy production is also positive and the system um, relaxes to equilibrium uh, and at equilibrium, the rate of entropy production is, is uh, zero. And also if I consider reversible transformation, the entropy production along those is approximately zero approximately is in this in the sense that it is of much lower order than the change of entropy and beta times the heat in the second law. Do you see my mouse when I show um, things? Yes, yes, I can see your mouse. mouse. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> so now the, the, I will move to trying to, okay, where does this come from, from a more uh, microscopic uh, fundamental point of view, and namely uh, from a system reservoir picture in terms of uh, a quantum mechanical description uh, of the full system, Hamiltonian one. And my, my talk will be split into two parts. The first one is the one concerned with a system reservoir setup. By this, I mean that the system is typically put in contact with the reservoir and stays in contact with that reservoir. I will first derive um, exact identities uh, in that setup. 
and then I will show you how one goes to the uh, how one derives stochastic thermodynamics from it and how these results follow from stochastic thermodynamics follow from these exact identities. In the second part, um, I will treat uh, the setup of repeated interaction where now it's more that the system is put in repeated uh, contact with different uh, systems that can play the role of the reservoir, but it's it's kind of iterative. Uh, and we will first consider non-autonomous uh, setups and then uh, mostly autonomous setup within scattering theory. So that's how I'm gonna address this problem of the inclusive approach to stochastic thermodynamics. And at the end, I will comment on, on other possible approaches. So let's start with the system reservoir setup. So what I have in mind here is um, you don't see my titles, or do you see them? Uh, I see open quantum systems. Ah, you see it. Okay, I don't see them, but you see them, <laughs> so that's good. Um, so the, I, I'm going to consider um, an Hamiltonian of everything. That's my full Hamiltonian system, which is made of a time-dependent system Hamiltonian, a, a bath, a reservoir, or I, I put E for environment, but in words, I'm going to often say reservoir. I'm sorry for that. So the, the reservoir Hamiltonian or the environment Hamiltonian and how the system and the environment interact and the time dependence can be both in the system or in the interaction. So the dynamics of this entire system is simply ruled uh, by the unitary evolution with the full Hamiltonian. Um, and I will choose, that's an important, that's actually the only assumption of, of no, well, this, the, these are the two only assumptions that I start from a factorized state between the system and the environment. And my environment or my reservoir is at equilibrium in a Gibbs state, but my system can be in any state. And now I will call the system dynamics, uh, the dynamics of the reduced density matrix of my system, which I obtain by tracing the full uh, density matrix of the entire system reservoir. And um, I can, this is the map that when applied on the initial condition of the system gives me the system at time t. I will denote it by S. Uh, sorry, Massimiliano. Uh, first yes. of all, uh, would you like? Uh, so, uh, are you assuming that the system and the reservoir are independent at time zero? So, in the initial condition, yes, because you see, I choose a factorized state here, rho s tensor product with the bath. But um, I don't, the the interaction could, in principle, be turned on already. You can think of it as a sudden switch. You can either think of it as the, the, the interaction is already on or you turn it on instantaneously at time zero. The, the only key assumption is this factorized uh, state here. Okay. Okay, so initially there are no correlations. So you can imagine that I bring my system in contact with my uh, reservoir at time zero. So there are no pre-existing correlations. Now, given this, it's a bit annoying that I don't see my title. But, so, um, given this, I can um, okay. I will. I, I don't see my title. Ah, what I can do? I, I don't know. Um, Yes. I see the title thermodynamic identities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and now I have it on the other computer, so it's fine. Thank you. Uh, so thermodynamic identities at the average level. So I will first focus at the average level and then I will move to the fluctuating level. So um, now these are definitions, but then I, I hope that I will be able to convince you of why they make sense. So the work will be the total change in the system in the total system. So it means that I, I know that, that when if I have a time independent Hamiltonian energy is conserved. So now I have a time dependent Hamiltonian. And so that time dependence causes the total energy to change. And that 
total energy change is going to be called the work. Okay, and that's why I can express it in terms of the time derivative of the Hamiltonian. Now, the heat is going to be defined as the amount of energy in the reservoir and its difference between the initial time and the final time with a minus sign because I, I, I like to count heat positive when it enters the system. Okay, so change of energy in the environment with a minus sign is the heat. The system entropy is the von Neumann entropy of the system. And the energy of my system is the, the, both the energy of the system and of the interactions. That's important is the fact that the interaction is there. But of course, if I initially turn it on and off, I can make that term disappear, even though it's there during the evolution. Now I can write a balance that links these different definition, the balance of energy of the system as work plus heat. And I can prove within the assumption that I showed before factorized initial states and starting at equilibrium in the bath, that the change in the, the entropy production defined as the change in the system entropy minus beta times, beta is the inverse temperature times the heat is always greater or equal than zero, which is the structure that we would expect from thermodynamics. But of course, I haven't said anything about the rate of entropy production. This really is fundamentally based on the fact that I started uncorrelated. And then I know that up to time t is going to be positive, but I'm not saying that the rate of entropy production is always going to be positive. This was first derived by uh, Jardinsky in uh, 99 in the classical setup. And uh, we derived it for quantum system as I presented it here um, with uh, Katja Lindenberg and Chris Vandenbroek in 2010. But furthermore, we could show that uh, we could rewrite this uh, second law, the form of the entropy production, as follows. Let me just remind you the definition of the relative entropy between two distribution, which is written down here and is always positive. It's a kind of measure of how different rho is from sigma. And the definition of the mutual information, which is you take the sum of the system and the environment and you remove the total entropy. Okay, and that quantity is also always positive because it, can be, because it can be written also as a relative entropy. So it's a measure of how correlated the system density matrix is from the environment density matrix. And I could, we could show that the entropy production can be written in, in this form here, this relative entropy, which compares how different the total density matrix is from the exact, the system exact density matrix, the one obtained by tracing over the bath, the full one, and the equilibrium one, the initial one of the bath. And I, and I like this expression because I think it represents well conceptually the type of information that is lost when we use a thermodynamic description in terms of the system, because what we keep the entire information about the system but we disregard the correlation with the environment and the state of the environment itself, which here is taken as assumed at equilibrium. And it's precisely that loss of information that is quantified by this entropy production. Furthermore, this uh, entropy production can also be split into two information theoretic quantity. One is the mutual information between the system and the environment. So this is really the part about the correlation, how many correlation there are between the system and the environment. And now it's the exact density matrix. And the second one, which tells me how away from equilibrium is my thermal reservoir. So Massimiliano, we have a, a, a question uh, in the chat. Uh, yes. uh, actually, it was sent to me. It's from Anupan Sarkar. Uh, asks, what happens to the First law, if some energy is hidden in the correlation established between system and reservoir during evolution. If the energy is said, right? 
yeah. energy is uh, stored. Did yeah. you say energy or entropy? Oh, if some energy is uh, okay, heat or I think stored in the correlation established between system and reservoir during evolution. Well, energy will be stored uh, if you want in in that, in the sense of the of of the of this interaction, and during the evolution, it's not a problem. Uh, and if you want to get this contribution out at the end of the evolution, you can turn off the interaction. Otherwise, it will still be there uh, at the end. But this doesn't uh, create any problem in the in the formalism. Everything that I said holds and is quantified by these quantities. Okay, thanks. Now, this... Um, Mutual uh, information contribution uh, to the entropy production. There is uh, this Araki leap inequality that tells us that it is bounded by the minimum between the system entropy and the environment entropy. And since the system can be quite small uh, in many practical applications that we care about, it doesn't need to, but often it will be. Um, it means that this is a serious constraint on these uh, on this part of the uh, entropy production. And, and I will show you now uh, in, in the next slide, how, uh, especially when, the, when we deal with more than one reservoir, um, this will mean that the dominant contribution will be the, the one due to the relative entropy between the, the bath and its equilibrium state. So let me furthermore do a further split that because I will use it in, in the next slides on, on the numerics. It's this, uh, this distance between the bath at time t and the bath at equilibrium can be further split if we are dealing with a non-interacting reservoir. So a non-interacting reservoir can be decomposed in different modes. Um, as itself, the, the a, a relative entropy that measures how far away each mode are from equilibrium and how, mo how much correlated these modes are with each other. So how much entropy is stored in between the modes uh, rather than in uh, how far they are from equilibrium. Okay, so keep in mind that this, these are these two contribution uh, to the distance of the entire reservoir from equilibrium. So now let's look at um, two reservoir. And it, this is a, a very simple non-interacting model. Uh, you can think of this as a, as a quantum dot, a uh, bath of uh, fermions and a coupling between the two. And we now turn on uh, the dynamics and we look at what happens to the entropy production. Um, the two temperatures are different of the two reservoirs. So there's gonna be a heat flow between the two reservoirs and entropy production you see increases linearly over time as expected because there's a continuous flux of heat. Um, of course, if we go very, very far our, because the system is finite, this is gonna change, but there's a, a, long time, a long regime over which we have this uh, linear growth of the entropy production. And you see that the, the part due to this, um, uh, correlation between the system and the environment, the mutual information uh, saturates quickly, while the part that contributes the most uh, to the entropy production is the distance uh, of the reservoir from equilibrium. And if we furthermore look at the details of that contribution, as I said before, it has two contribution, the part that is the correlation between the modes and the part of the how far away each mode is from equilibrium, you see, interestingly, that it's the correlation part that is actually dominant. So this is a non-trivial uh, observation. Okay, so it really means that the dissipation takes the form of correlation between the modes in the environment. Let's now look at a single reservoir. And this is, um, all this uh, work has been done by Christoph uh, Kaczynski, I should emphasize that. Um, so if we look now at uh, a single reservoir, there's an interesting phenomena that we observe, which is 
has been coined by Christoph post termination because you see that this, from the system perspective, this is the entropy production, the system quite quickly relaxes to equilibrium. We can say that more or less around here, the system is at equilibrium. But there's still non-trivial dynamics going on in the reservoir. And this can be directly seen by this, this swap between the dominant contribution at short time, the dominant contribution is the one due to correlations, okay? Here, the Araki uh, leap inequality is less stringent because we don't have this extensive um, behavior because there's no heat continuously flowing. It's a system that is not at equilibrium and relaxes to equilibrium. So that's why otherwise the, the, the other uh, contribution, uh, this one would take over, but because here, um, it's not the case, both are important. And you see that in the early phase of the, dyna of the, yeah, of the dynamics, the, um, the entropy production is dominated by this correlation between the, the system and the environment. And then they decay over after the system has already relaxed. And what becomes dominant is actually the distance from equilibrium uh, in the bath. So this is also a non-trivial effect, which shows that things can go on in the bath that are not seen from the system perspective uh, only. And further, we can do as, 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 as before, look at the two contribution to the uh, relative entropy here. And once again, we see that it is dominated by the correlation between the modes rather than from the distance between each mode from equilibrium. Now let me do a, a final, uh, more recent observation, which is, okay, from the C, we know that from the system perspective, the different ensembles uh, in the sense of statistical mechanics, uh, canonical, microcanonical, do not, should not matter too much. And this is well studied and we know under what condition we have a kind of equivalence. But now we ask the question, what about uh, this entropy production expressed um, in terms of its different contribution when uh, we look at different ensembles? And here we have two different models. One is, is, is called the spin worm. It's a two level system coupled to a bath that is described by a random matrix. Um, and the coupling is in sigma uh, X. So this can be seen as a way to mimic in a very simple way, a many body system. And the other one is, an, is the previous model that we uh, had before, um, a non-interacting fermionic uh, system. And let's look at what happened to the different contribution to the entropy production. When we consider a thermal reservoir, as we did before, we compare it with a microcanonical reservoir whose energy is chosen, of course, in such a way that it fits the, ter the, the temperature of the canonical one for two different energy with width of the energy shell. And we even take the extreme case of a single eigenstate um, such that uh, the energy the matches uh, with the canonical one at the given temperature T. And you see that uh, at the level of the entropy production, there's a perfect agreement with uh, all of them. But if we look at the, the two contribution, correlation between system and bath and distance of the bath from equilibrium, we see uh, significant uh, differences. And um, the same is true. I will, since we are a bit late, I will go, I will simply say that the same is true also in the uh, interacting model. So the lesson here is uh, once again, that the entropy production, you can think of it as a, feature of the system. At the end, we will express it only in terms of the system dynamics, but this uh, information theoretic contribution to the entropy production, um, they really depend on what's happening in the bath and, and there is really non-trivial information hidden in those quantities um, and different system can display uh, very uh, significant differences between uh, what is happening in the bath, although from the system perspective, everything is equivalent. That's the lesson here. Okay, so now I move to um, fluctuating level. This is a, a bit uh, more technical, but 
I will try not to dig too much into the technicalities. Uh, the technicalities themselves are actually uh, well known and it's not new. Um, the point here is to define fluctuations to do fluctuating thermodynamics. And uh, it is known that the, the way to, to do it in quantum system is to use the two point measurement approach. This means that we consider the system Hamiltonian and the Hamiltonian of every bath, if they are n bath. And we imagine that at time zero, uh, we measure projectively the energy of the system and all the bath, okay? Then we propagate the system with the full unitary dynamics. And at time t, we measure again that energy. And now these so-called counting fields, lambda, they will be the conjugate variable to the energy change of each of these Hamiltonians here. So lambda will keep track of the changes of energy in the system, lambda s, sorry, in the system, lambda one in bath one, et cetera. Um, the key object, the central object of the theory is the generating function. You see, it's a modified unitary, uh, it's a modified operator that if lambda would be equal to zero would be the unitary evolution, uh, but it has now this e to the lambda h, which are the these counting fields, lambda. And you can, if lambda is equal to zero, of course, this trace here would be um, equal to one, uh, but because the lambda, if when the lambda are non-zero, it's as if the, the, the system is, the, the, the quantity is counting the energy exchanges and you can get the moments of these uh, energy transfer by derivative with respect to lambda. And another, another, you can also say that if you send lambda to I lambda and you take the Fourier transform, you actually reconstruct the joint probability distribution of all the energy exchanges in the system and in the different reservoirs. So this has the full statistical information about the energy changes uh, between every object, system, and bath uh, in, in, in the system, in the total system. We can also define the time reversed uh, one. This is going to be important. We know that in quantum mechanics, the dagger evolution has to do with the time reversal operation. And um, we will consider for the forward evolution that we will assume that we start as, as um, before in a factorized state. But to get what is called the detailed fluctuation theorem, I will also assume that the, I, I initialize my system in a Gibbs state at a different at the temperature beta s that can be different from the one of the of the bath. And then I propagate with this modified with this dressed evolution um, this initial density matrix to get the generating function at time t. And for the time reversed one, I start also with a factorized state, but the Gibbs state of the system now is taken to be at the final value um, of the uh, forward evolution, okay? So I reinitialize the system at equilibrium and then I implement the backward dynamics. And one can show that there is this fundamental symmetry between the statistics in the forward process and the statistics in the backward process. Um, which involves the change in free energy. Again, this is a result that uh, Chris Jasinski derived for classical system in 99 already, but in quantum uh, mechanics, it was under this exact form derived uh, very recently in this paper, but it was already implicit um, in um, various, for instance, my review in 2009 and paper by Gaspar um, and Tasaki um, and Andrieu. Uh, around the same time. Now, this is uh, what we call detail the fluctuation theorem because it really involves the forward dynamics and the backward dynamics. And we there is also an integral fluctuation theorem, which is slightly more general for in terms of the initial condition, but of course less detailed than the previous one in terms of the statistical information because uh, it doesn't compare forward and a backward evolution. 
it, it will only make a statement about the statistics of the forward evolution. In this case, we can take, as I used before when I presented the second law, the identity at the average level, I can take any um, uh, density matrix for the system factorized with the bath at equilibrium. And I can look at the two points statistics in the sense of the measurement as described here. But now instead of measuring the energy of the system, I measure, this is of course, uh, how to do that is, is not trivial. It's more of a conceptual result. You can projectively measure uh, um, log rho in the basis that diagonalizes log rho. And you can show that the generating function uh, at a given value minus one of the counting field, which is equivalent to taking the average of the exponential of the entropy production, which is now a fluctuating quantity because we measure that quantity, is equal to one. And this is the so-called integral fluctuation theorem. And it implies that in average, the entropy production is equal to zero, which is the result that I, it's equivalent to the result I was showing you before. Okay, so this is to show you that these exact identities uh, must be there really if you consider these classes of initial condition. It might sound a bit abstract. It, it actually is a bit abstract, <laughs> but um, it has practical implication uh, when we will try to build the theory only at the system level only. Uh, furthermore, there is another important symmetry, which is energy conservation. In this case, I, I, I uh, restrict myself to time independent Hamiltonian when the total energy of the system and bath is conserved. And this has this implies that, not too surprisingly, since lambda is really counting all the energies, it means that the, this dressed lambda. And I realized I forgot to define the dressed lambda. I'm sorry for that. So the dressed lambda is the object just before taking the trace here. Okay, so it's the u uh, lambda applied on row zero and u dagger lambda on the other side. So if that that object will have that symmetry, so that's one additional symmetry that needs to be uh, conserved and uh, respected. The the strict way to implement that is a, is a kind of uh, trivial one, is to assume that the coupling uh, commutes uh, with the system and the bath Hamiltonian. But this is, of course, uh, quite strong. And um, it's not necessary, as we will see at the level of the effective system description. So now, let, let, um, let me say the following. These are exact identities. And I, I'm totally, I understand that they might not be, I mean, it's a bit technical, but the, the important message is these identities, we know that they must be satisfied. Um, and so we, as we will now try to derive uh, an effective description in terms of the system only, what we want to make sure is that the effective theory does not destroy those symmetries that we identified. And uh, basically, this has the following consequences. If we now look at the system density matrix still evolved with this lambda dressed operator, uh, we will get these um, effective uh, operators acting in the system space that will need to satisfy this symmetry. So this symmetry is the consequence of this previous symmetry at the level of the system evolution. Until now, this is still exact. Now comes the key point, is that when we want to get a closed dynamics for the system density matrix, we typically need to assume this semi-group property of the evolution of the system. And that's really where the most uncontrolled approximation uh, appear. Um, and as a result of that approximation, we get what is called the super operator of the evolution of the reduced density matrix of the system, which fully characterizes the dynamics of the system. We closed the dynamics for, for the system. We don't need to care anymore about the bath if this is valid, if these assumptions are valid, we can only resolve the system uh, dynamics. And we can, one can show that these symmetries that I mentioned before have constrained 
at the level of this effective dynamics. So if you don't want your fundamental symmetries to be broken, you need to make sure that this super operator has uh, this symmetry here, which is the fluctuation theorem symmetry, which is reminiscent of a detailed balance con condition. That's what we call generalized uh, quantum detailed balance condition. And also the energy conservation condition, which is that one. And that's now a kind of guide um, to check that the effective theories are correct. And one can show that they imply the uh, stochastic thermodynamics, basically, at the system level. We can really show that um, now we can write the balance of energy for the system in terms of heat. Entropy production rate is positive now. Not only the integrated one, but also the rate is now positive. And I, I can, for those who are familiar with that, I can make contact with the traditional definition uh, in the literature that were obtained a long time ago, in the case of a single reservoir for the heat in term of, uh, in the context of quantum master equations. And we can also show that the Gibbs state is the fixed point of the super operator, meaning that the dynamics will actually relax to equilibrium. So we really have all the requirements that I mentioned at the beginning uh, of phenomenological thermodynamics. Um, now, a few comments about the well-known quantum master equation. Do they satisfy or not these conditions? The Redfield equation, we know it's not of Lindblad form, so it has already fundamental issues in terms of preserving uh, the hermeticity and, and the positivity of the, the, of the matrix. Um, the, it has not the fluctuation theorem symmetry and it doesn't conserve energy. So strictly speak, of course, it doesn't mean, you know, you can always violate this in a weak way, but the structure of the equation has none of those symmetries. Recently, some symmetrized uh, version of these master of these Redfield master equation, which are now of Lin platform, have been considered. They do have the fluctuation theorem, uh, the fluctuation theorem symmetry, but uh, they don't conserve uh, energy at the fluctuating level, only in average. And then uh, the one this is kind of known in a sense we are only recovering a known result, but uh, with this more systematic machinery uh, is that the Redfield equation, when we apply the rotating wave approximation, um, or when the levels are degenerate, they are, this, these are, this is a level of theory which is fully consistent with all the symmetry. And it, it, it preserves all the fundamental symmetries for, from first law and second law at the fluctuating level, also at the effective level. And I think, what, what did we gain? Well, I think, we gained an easy way in terms of these, if, if you derive a master equation, rather than having to explicitly recalculate everything to check that all the fluctuation theorem, et cetera, are satisfied, you can immediately check if those two fundamental symmetries are preserved. And if they are, you know that stochastic thermodynamics is ensured uh, at the level of this uh, effective theory. Okay, so I hope that with this, I could, kind of show you that uh, at least for the system reservoir classical setup, we have these fundamental identities uh, in the full space that can be derived. And as we trace out the bath, we can construct a reduced description only in terms of the system dynamics. And we can have, we can build thermodynamics in terms of this reduced description. <laughs> and we need to make sure that the, the, those fundamental symmetries are preserved at the effective level. And if they are, we basically succeeded in construct, in deriving uh, an effective uh, stochastic, uh, an effective theory, which is called stochastic thermodynamics for open systems where we don't need to explicitly track what is happening uh, in the bath. So I will now move to the second part. If there are questions, maybe it's a, it's a good time to ask. And also, how much time do I have given the mess uh, of starting later and all that? Okay, so uh, we have to start with the next, uh, I mean, in the program, we have to start uh, with the next um, uh, tutorial in uh, half six, so there is half an hour. But uh, maybe uh, if uh, Hugo is okay with this, maybe we can eat up a little bit of his time 
if if there are many questions. And um, so there was uh, one. Uh, so essentially, I think uh, maybe you can go on. Uh, I think you you can go on for another twenty minutes if that's okay. Yes. Okay. And then we see how it goes. And uh, there was a question in the chat from before. Um, and uh, so, uh, so is this formulation consists for work? Uh, com um, okay, I'll read it. So is this formulation for work considered possible exchange of energy through work uh, between two subsystem environment and systems? So, um, uh, okay. so, so let me try to repeat. So I, I, if I understand, it, it, the question is whether they can be work uh, between the exchange between the, the system and the environment, right? Yeah, yes. So uh, yes, in the sense that the, um, the, the work contains these, um, Two contribution in this formulation. It it, it contains the because the, uh, the the this is the the work is expressing to the time dependent change of the full Hamiltonian and the full Hamiltonian in the most general case has time dependence both in the system and in the coupling, meaning that even if there's no time dependence in the system, but you turn on and turn off the coupling, for instance, then there will be work due to this turning on and off of the coupling. Mm -hmm. So there is work really at the interface between the system and the reservoir. Okay, I don't see other questions in the chat. So uh, uh, now, uh, well, uh, there's a question, what is uh, Lindblad? Um, ah, Lindblad is the most general form of master equation that preserves some basic properties of the um, density matrix. So this is a, a known result in the literature on open quantum system of this, the, 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 the symmetries. I mean, entering into the detail would be too long, but the symmetries that the most general form of a master equation that preserves uh, the positivity of the density matrix, the hermeticity, the trace equal to one, and the complete positivity, which is a bit more involved. But um, yeah, so basically, if it doesn't, it's uh, you need to be careful and, and you need to understand that there might be problems. Um, uh, of course, the, the amount of, of the problem is can be related to the validity of your approximations, but and it is debated whether this is a major issue or not. But you need to be cautious when it's not of lean platform. To make a long story short, a debate of 34 years in <laughs> in one minute. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I don't see other questions in the chat, uh, and uh, so maybe you can go ahead uh, and uh, maybe uh, for the rest, maybe we can collect uh, uh, questions in the chat uh, and then uh, we will ask, uh, uh, we will address them at the end. Okay. Okay. And I, I will try to, to give more, uh, to go a bit quicker so that I don't eat too much time for the others. Okay. Um, to emphasize the, the main points. Okay. So now I move to the second part, which is repeated interaction. This is now where it's not anymore that we put the system in contact with the bath and we leave it there in contact with the bath. The picture that you should have in mind is that the system is put repeatedly in interaction with things that I call units. Uh, and so, you know, there's a first interaction with one unit, then the next in, uh, unit comes in and, and the units are always fresh. So there are no initial correlations between the system and the units. And, and then the evolution of the system unit happens with the unitary evolution given by the total Hamiltonian system plus unit plus coupling. And then every, for every uh, interaction, there's an evolution. And so you iterate these different evolutions and, and that's kind of a repeated interaction, uh, repeated um, uh, interaction uh, setup, okay? In the traditional, uh, I mean, this has been also studied a, a lot uh, some, some years ago. And in, in this paper, there's really a, a complete description of that. But 
in the non-autonomous uh, setup. By this, I mean that the way in which we imagine that the interaction occurs is by turning on and off the interaction between the system and the unit, but turning it on and off with a time-dependent Hamiltonian, okay? There's no notion of space at this level. And it actually relates to the question that, that the, the, the person was asking about the work between the system and the uh, environment. Because if we start with thermal units, we can derive a first law and a second law. And I, I, I send you to, to this paper here for the details, but, and this is a point that was emphasized by Felipe, first by Felipe Barra, one should be aware that because we turn on and off the interaction, we are doing work on our system. And as a result of that, it is not surprising, and this was a puzzle uh, during some time in the literature, it is not surprising that the system does not relax to equilibrium because we are continuously driving it due to this work. You know, we expect in thermodynamics the system to relax to equilibrium if it is not driven, but if we keep driving it, it's not going to relax to equilibrium. And so these models can be thermodynamically consistent, but generically they don't correspond to a system, even if we initialize the units in thermal states, they're not going to mimic the effect of a thermal bath or they're not going to thermalize the system. And uh, therefore, I mean, it's motivated by that, that uh, actually um, Felipe Baja, uh, Juan Parondo, uh, Sam Jacob, uh, we started um, thinking about a more fundamental description of these repeated interaction. And uh, we use the scattering approach. And so here there's no time dependence. Uh, and the time dependence of before is explicitly, we expect to, to, to describe it more microscopically, more realistically by in, incorporating space. And uh, you see now the, the Hamiltonian looks uh, as follows. We have the system, uh, the, the, the unit, which you, th you should now think of HU as the Hamiltonian of the internal degrees of freedom of the unit, but we add uh, kinetic degrees of freedom to the unit. So there's space that is introduced. The unit has a kinetic energy. Um, and that's why it can move. So it's not that we are turning on and off to mimic the effect of, of the interaction. It's really that the, the units are moving and they collide with the system. And, and that creates de facto this repeated interaction. And the interaction now depends, of course, on space and will happen only in a region where the potential is, is localized. Uh, and before and after, uh, we leave the interacting region. And that's why we can use uh, scattering theory to look at the dynamics of this uh, type of uh, setups. And it's, I mean, we, I don't go into any detail of scattering theory, but these scattering operators, um, they, they preserve the, the unitarity of the full dynamics. Um, they preserve also uh, energy. So uh, the scattering matrix commutes with the total energy of the system. In that sense, we have a first law saying that the, the change of energy in the system and unit is always compensated by a change, a corresponding change in kinetic energy, okay? The kinetic energy of incoming and outgoing uh, wave packets. Uh, and the unitarity of the, of the scattering matrix implies that the mutual information um, can be uh, split into the entropy change into system and unit, again, the internal part, and the, the one due to the kinetic degrees of freedom. And this is what we are going to use to the energy balance and the entropy balance to, to look at different limiting case of uh, how we prepare these kinetic degrees of freedom and also the internal degrees of freedom to mimic either a work source or a, a, a heat bath, a heat source. Um, so the key point will be to distinguish between two types of wave packets. So these kinetic degrees of freedom. In one case, we refer to narrow wave packets. This is depicted picturally here as wave packets, which are narrow in momentum. 
and narrow is compared to the typical energy of the system, okay? And system here, think of it as system unit uh, for the moment. I, I really, all the internal part of the system and of the units uh, are this SU, this joint SU system, and it has some uh, energies and, and frequencies associated to this energy. And so if the wave packet is narrow compared to this typical energy, the, you, you have the following uh, picture holding that you have a certain wave packet with a, a certain momentum going in, and then it exchanges energy uh, with the uh, system unit, internal degrees of freedom. And since these energies are large compared to the width, you ba basically get well separated peaks after uh, the interaction. To be uh, dis uh, distinguished from the broad situation, where there the width is large compared to this uh, typical energy scale of the system, internal uh, system unit uh, system. And, and there you have more this picture. You still have overlap and you, it's harder to tell uh, what happened really in terms of exchanges due to this overlap, okay? So this will be the central concept, broad and narrow wave packets. Um, <clears throat> we can show that if we consider narrow wave packets, uh, the narrow wave packet always induce um, a decoherence process. So the decoherence in the system unit internal space will die off and we will be left with a Markov chain for the population in the system unit. That's the first important result, but at the moment still not enough to connect to thermodynamics. The, the, the second important result is that uh, if we prepare these wave packets distributed in uh, momenta using the so-called effusion distribution. So effusion is well known in classical kinetic theory. It's the, this, the, the velocity distribution. If you look at the particle coming out from a, a, a box with an equilibrium gas, uh, what is the velocity at which they come out uh, at, at, the, at the level of a very small hole that you poked into the box? It's essentially the Maxwell uh, velocity distribution, but reweighted by the fact that the fast particles are oversampled. And that's why you have this additional term here. So it's a well-known thing for things coming out of a, of a thermal reservoir. So if you assume that these wave packets now are distributed according to such a, uh, in velocity and momentum, according to such an effusion distribution with narrow wave packets, this is also important, you can prove that uh, the decoherence is still valid because of the narrow wave packets. And furthermore, because of the effusion distribution, the map satisfies the property of detail balance, which ensures that the system will relax to equilibrium. Keep in mind that now system, it's still system and unit together. So these internal degrees of freedom will terminalize and we really can say that the kinetic, these kinetic degrees of freedom uh, play the role of a heat reservoir because that energy that is exchanged, that, that comes from the change in kinetic energy of the incoming and outgoing uh, packets um, is really the heat, okay? And um, also the entropy balance, you see that the heat appears uh, as a change of entropy. So this is exactly what we, what we would expect, what we had in stochastic thermodynamics for heat bath. But it's still system and unit internal degrees of freedom. But we can go further. We can also show that if furthermore we assume that the uh, internal uh, uh, part of the unit is thermal, okay, also the system will thermalize. Everything now that I said before for system unit applies now for the system alone. So the system itself will thermalize and uh, satisfy uh, a second law, a first law, and will relax to a well-defined Gibbs uh, distribution with respect to its own Hamiltonian, okay? We can also show that if the internal degrees of freedom are at a different temperature with respect to the kinetic ones, that we, the system will remain out of equilibrium and will be dissipating. So this is to, to show you that it's, it's a funny application. You basically send these particles, particles in the sense of here, the particle was the internal unit plus its kinetic degrees of freedom, but you could prepare 
both of them, you imagine that they've been prepared in different temperatures and the interaction with the system will now allow a heat flowing between the internal degrees of freedom of the particle and the kinetic ones. And you can look at the entropy production and you see that you only reach zero when the temperature of the internal degrees of freedom matches the one of the kinetic degrees of freedom. So this is a kind of fancy application. Okay, now I want to convince you that we can, this was for heat. Now I want to convince you that we can also do uh, work. And uh, here, the message is the following. If we prepare um, the wave packets uh, at high velocity, this, is, this corresponds to a kind of semi-classical limit. So the, the kinetic energy is high compared to the interaction uh, potential. And also the, 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 the typical spatial uh, scale over which the potential varies uh, must not be too small compared to uh, this uh, incoming velocity. So the, the wave packet cannot resolve these uh, fine details of the potential. It, the potential must be sufficiently smooth uh, in a sense. And furthermore, uh, we consider broad wave packets as defined before. In that, I, and I, I should also emphasize that now I can define a, a time that is given by the typical distance of the interaction. The, the, this is the time, the spatial scale over which the interaction happens and the velocity of the incoming wave packets that gives me a time. And that time will be important to compare now with this uh, non-autonomous description that I was referring before, because we can show that in that case, the, the map, the scattering map really takes the form of what we would expect for a time dependent map. So without space, but only time, uh, provided that the, the potential now is uh, represented by the spatial averaging of the real spatial potential. And so you see this is this V is this spatial average potential. And the tau is the tau obtained using um, this uh, quite natural picture. Um, and you can really explicitly show that if these conditions are met, the scattering, map, the scattering maps coincide with the non-autonomous map that I uh, mentioned when I was describing this non-autonomous description of repeated interaction. So we could really connect the two type of description and derive the, uh, the one that was mostly used in the past uh, to this one in a certain limit. Uh, that's also the same limit that justifies using uh, time dependent Hamiltonians. Uh, and uh, we can also explicitly show that the, the energy balance in this case and the entropy balance match with what we would expect for a work source because now the change in energy, uh, the kinetic energy change uh, corresponds to the, um, to the work and, uh, and there's no entropy change um, in the wave packet because it is semi-classical. So the, there's kind of a very uh, negligible effect um, on the entropy change of the interaction with the system. Okay, I will skip the numerics. The numerics uh, confirms what I said uh, theoretically. And uh, let me just repeat and, and conclude this part saying that we basically identified two different regimes uh, that in this scattering approach to repeated interactions where we can use wave packets to describe a heat reservoir. So in that sense, they really play the role of a heat bath that thermalizes the system. And, we could, uh, and, and the other extreme limit is the limit where we have broad wave packets, semi-classical, that really do work when they interact with the, with the system. And we think that this is uh, interesting. This should be seen as two extreme case, of course. There are plenty of in-between case, and, and these will be neither heat nor work. They will have more non-trivial effects from an energetic point of view, because there's gonna be non-trivial information uh, effects in, in, in intermediate cases. Uh, and, and we hope that this could be a, an interesting way to approach uh, the, the problems of energetics uh, in systems like this uh, cavity uh, QED, uh, where we one sends atoms through cavities and one can control how 
one can prepare them before they interact with the cavity. And so one could maybe uh, play these kinds of game of preparing objects in work-like or heat-like states uh, and, and see if, if everything I said uh, can be reproduced in those experiments. Um, I was this I will skip for the sake of time. Uh, we, yeah, let me simply skip that. And, um, and let me conclude. Uh, I, I hope I, I managed to show you that at least in those, these two setups that I consider, um, system reservoir setup and repeated interaction setup, both have in common that we always at time zero have no correlation between the system and the reservoir or the units uh, that we can really derive from microscopic uh, quantum mechanics uh, with assumption of initial equilibrium for certain degrees of freedom, the phenomenological laws of thermodynamics or of stochastic thermodynamics. And we understand also how system thermalize or not. And I also want to say by this, that there's of course much more to say about this uh, topic uh, because I only focus on these uncorrelated states, but there's been uh, a lot of work also on um, correlated initial state. The simplest case is we, we start really from a, a full Gibbs state between the system and the reservoir, and we drive them with a time dependent Hamiltonian uh, or uh, a more refined uh, approach that works only for classical system, the, the generalization to quantum is, is still more open, uh, where we consider conditionally equilibrated system reservoir states, where the, the system at time zero interacts with the reservoir, but it, one, one fixes its uh, degrees of freedom in certain states. So this is a kind of conditional uh, non-equilibrium state. And one can also derive uh, first law, second laws, which are actually quite different from the ones I showed. So this is intriguing. It, it shows the importance of the second law, uh, of the initial condition, sorry, uh, on this different formulation uh, of the second law. And I also want to say that um, there's there are all these other types of approaches, which are interesting. I, I, I think I, I, I would have loved to comment more on that because there are interesting connections. Uh, between what I said and these other approaches, but this is where we we basically consider a, a many-body system that is isolated, and one tries to to describe the thermodynamics of certain observables, typically in kinetic theory like Boltzmann equations, single particle densities, um, and I think there I can show that there are many concepts from this uh, correlation entropy that that play a similar role as as in the system reservoir setup and also ETH, which is uh, yet another approach. Um, so there's many, much more out there, but I, I, I focused on, on what I could uh, cover within an hour. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. So now um, the session is open for uh, questions. And um, so um, either you can write it on the chat. I don't know whether uh, uh, participants are able to unmute themselves and uh, ask directly a question. Um, so I have a say, I have a question on on the first part, uh, but which uh, maybe goes a little bit uh, off uh, from what you have uh, been discussing. So one uh, particular application I've been interested in is uh, is um, training of, uh, say, neural networks. And then you can think uh, that you have, uh, uh, say, a system which is put in contact with uh, uh, with an environment which is the data. And uh, I was uh, wondering whether this uh, uh, law that you were, because you can think uh, that you start uh, from a factorized state where essentially your machine uh, that you are training and the data are independent. And then when you put them in contact, uh, then uh, you 
and you train, you you you, you get a state which is uh, entangled. So I, I was wondering whether in general one can uh, apply uh, this uh, um, the, the, these ideas and in particular the way of computing uh, thermodynamic quantities from these uh, relative entropies uh, also yeah. in that case. It's an interesting question and, and I, I thought about this uh, too. Um, I, in a sense, it goes beyond what I presented because it goes into here. I really, I, I was sticking to heat and work sources, but but many of the things, um, many, this formalism can be extended to more complicated reservoirs, which are in non-equilibrium states. And this is a bit what your um, the, the picture that you're describing. If you think of, of learning, you have a data set. There is information in that that data set. And, and that would, if, if you're, it's interesting to ask whether one can think of training, the, the energetics of training, but that would, the, one would need to enter the realm of, of this information thermodynamics where we start looking at entropy and energy balance with not only heat and work reservoir, but also with more general non-equilibrium reservoirs, uh, which can exchange uh, both information and energy and try to see if one can derive useful balance uh, and, and say interesting things. I think at the moment, it's hard to, to say whether one mm -hmm. can say, one will be able to say something interesting, but it's certainly an appealing idea. Thank you very much. So the, there is uh, Shervin Parsi. Uh, can you unmute yourself? Oh, yes, thank you. Um, so you I have a question. On the camera also, so we can. Yeah, see. absolutely. Thank you. So, yeah, hi. so uh, I want to know what if you study the time evolutional time time evolution of the conditional distribution of system condition on observation of environment. So let's say that I am observing the microscopic state of my environment. So I want to study PS condition over E. Yeah. Um, so let me first say that. This counting field is a, is a simple form of conditioning because I keep track of what is exchanged in the environment by projecting at time zero and projecting at time t. So in a sense, when I extend my dynamics by keeping track of this lambda, this is already what I do. But one can also uh, look at that uh, in a more systematic way. Uh, I, I did this from a dynamical point of view in, in my thesis. Uh, I was interested in tracking energy in, 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 the, in the bath. And, and recently, uh, Philip Strasberg has looked at the thermodynamics of that. Um, but that's only but my one question, example. My question one is that in this picture, when you are conditioned over your environment, uh, if the environment is at the equilibrium, then environment turns to an ideal work source, right? Because you are driving, because you are observing your environment. Uh, and that's acts like a protocol that's drive your system X. Yeah. Okay. So 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 my question my question is that it, it seems to me there is a dual rule for environment. Either if you if you go to the ensemble picture when you when you see the environment as a system, or you you measure it, you reduce to the microscopic state of the environment. And so, so in that picture, you say heat reservoir, and in the in the in when you measure it, it reduced to the work parameter. This this is my question. Yeah, so it's not as simple as it reduced to the work parameter because uh, I can say the following: if you if the interaction is weak, uh, and you measure energy, this is called uh, foot, um, counting statistics. It's used in, in photon counting statistics. People do this in experiments. You have an atom, for instance, and you look at the photons that are emitted by the atom, or you have a quantum dot, and you look at the electrons that are tunneling in and out of the quantum dot. You basically can condition your dynamics on these events that you observe. Uh, and if your ensemble average, you recover what I said. But at the fluctuating level, that would lead you, if you measure in energy, so energy measurement in the weak coupling limit would totally be consistent with what I described as fluctuating thermodynamics. 
where you enter a different paradigm is if you start measuring observables in the bath that are not commuting with the energy. Because then you start having non-trivial uh, effects from a thermodynamic point of view. Uh, and it's, yeah, you, there I think it's much less easy to make clear thermodynamic sense of what is happening in terms of energy balance because the, the energy balance is affected, the entropy balance is affected, but it's hard to give a, a, a meaningful interpretation of that. But the, the message is for a, whatever commutes with energy in the weak coupling limit perfectly fits with this. So you can do it. It's, it's simply looking, the, the, the ensemble average theory will coincide with what I presented. When you care about integrated observable, where you will get this fluctuation theorem, but you can go even further, uh, look at first passage time and things like that. If it's things that do not commute with the energy, I think this is much more open. And in, in by weak coupling, you mean that uh, the reservoir evolved really from the system? Uh, that, uh, I didn't understand the word. By, you... um, I want to, the, you, I, by weak coupling, you mean that the, uh, the environment is not affected with the system? Yes. So I actually, the, the precise meaning is, is this semi group property that I was referring to here. Um, this and okay. it has to do it can be easily justified when the interaction strength between the system and the bus is weak and it has to do with saying that every dt it is okay to assume that my bath is again reinitialized as if it was at equilibrium okay thank you okay so thank you so we have uh, two other questions one from uh, jim fu chen can you um uh Hello, hello, I have, I, have, I have a question on this page uh, that uh, you, you add a counting field oh, on the... Sorry, can you turn your uh, camera on? Uh, uh, I, I just have a quest, question on this page, uh, on this slide. Uh, uh, here, here you, you add a counting field on the, on the new wheel super operator, uh, yeah. which act on the system. And I see that you you just add the coming field uh, symmetrically, uh, and uh, I just wondering uh, uh, is there any principle to tell you how to add the counting field for for such a quantum system? Because because uh, I, I think this is okay for in blood uh, uh, operate in the blood master equations, but uh, I I have considered you this. Uh, ways to calculate the work statistics of the quantum Brownian motion uh, master equation. But I, I, but it seems that uh, sometimes you will find that uh, the, the work distribution will become a quasi-probability instead uh, of a probability. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, is there, uh, whether we can, uh, whether there are some knowledge to tell you how to add the, uh, counting field. Yes, the, the systematic procedure is this two point projective measurement. If you do that, you really get a, a, a probability. You don't get a quasi probability. But what you mentioned is a known in, in the beginning of, of counting statistics in, in 2007, eight, people were, they didn't have really a rigorous rationale to how to put them. And, and they would sometimes get quasi probabilities. Um, so I, I recommend to, to really try to start from the two-point projective measurement. You will make sure that this is a real probability. And then you can see what's the difference with what you did and which led to uh, quasi-probabilities. Uh, uh, I, yes, I, I, uh, f uh, if, you, if you start from the unitary evolution, it is always a probability. But uh, if you use a master equation to describe the evolution, and sometimes you you find uh, you you find uh, uh, the, it becomes uh, complex or negative. But you need the, the difficulty is how do you add the counting field in the at the level of the master equation in yes, a controlled yes. way? This is not a trivial question, and that's why you can get surprises. And to, okay. to be 
sure, it's better to always start from the, the full description, trace out your reservoir. There you know where to put your, your accounting field. Then you trace out the reservoir and you see where they end up in your master equation. Oh, uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have another equi uh, question from uh, Vladimir Villegas. Uh, you wrote it in the chat. Maybe, Vladimir, if you are there, you can just unmute yourself and ask the question directly. It was hi, hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, I would just want to ask because it seems that the first and the third laws were pointed out for the inclusive uh, formalism. How about the zeroth law? Would there be, I mean, with all these things coming in hand, would there be effects on the zeroth law of the thermodynamics? Okay, by the, the zero law, the traditional formulation is the existence of an equilibrium such that uh, if, if you assign a temperature to it and you put A and B uh, at same temperature, there will be no heat flow and, and then you can use a triangular A and B and B and C and C and A uh, will all not exchange heat if the temperature is a proper well-defined right? This is what you have in mind. Yes, that's it. Would there be an effect um, uh, with all of these things? Would there be an effect on it? I think in the weak coupling, uh, it, it, the, the, the zero slow will be uh, well uh, respected. Um, when you go to the strong coupling, of course, you're going to have to turn on the interactions and, and then it becomes a bit more tricky because the zero slow usually has neglects effects of interaction. So I would say by default, when you when you can derive effective, effectively stochastic thermodynamics, the zero slow is built in. But if you want to go beyond weak coupling, um, it, it might be a bit more tricky. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mas Massimiliano. So that was uh, really great. And uh, but I think uh, we can move to the next tutorial by Hugo. Hugo, are you there? Yes. So thank you very much for uh, joining. So we move to. Um, can you share the screen, uh, uh, Hugo? Yeah. Um, very good. <clears throat> I assume you see the full screen. So Matteo, okay. can you confirm you see you see the slide, yes? Yeah. Yes, we see the slide, yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Should I start then? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, first thanks to the organizers for the invitation and organizing these uh, tutorials. Um, I'm quite glad to see that there are so many participants. Um, it's nice to have such a big audience from different places. I'm not going to say good afternoon, or I guess it's morning for many uh, people. Um, so I'll be talking, I'll give a, 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 a tutorial on large deviation theory and how it's, we can apply it to calculate distribution.